There we go. Thank you very much indeed. And apologies have been from Jim Wells and Pat Catney. And Pat has delegated his vote to Matthew, who should be along. And Gemma has delegated her vote to Melissa. Could she? Will be okay. Thank you very much indeed. Any declarations of interest? Nope. Uh, and number three, uh, chairperson's business informal meeting. Uh, I met the chairperson of the Northern Ireland Fiscal Commission along with Peter yesterday. Uh, we discussed the likely timescale for the final report from the Northern Ireland Fiscal Commission, and you'll have also seen in the media you'll seen the uh, press release that they pushed out, the recommendations that they're likely to make, particularly around uh, sort of tax varying powers, the mo move about income tax, but also the likely timelines are likely to be anywhere between about 48 years and going forward. Um, so uh, I made our sort of a couple of the points and a couple of observations to do with it as well. But we expect the report to come out in May, and uh, bearing in mind we have no idea what is going to happen to this place, but there is an expectation that we would uh, have an invitation to uh, attend uh, that launch as, as we go forward. Okay. Any other comments? Thank you. Uh, draft minutes of proceedings. Draft minutes of proceedings. Of the finance uh, meeting on the 16th of March, are page seven. Is the committee content that the draft meetings the 16th of March are an accurate and a complete record of proceedings? Is that agreed? Agreed. <coughs> As this is the final meeting of the mandate, is the committee content that the chairperson approve the minutes of today's meeting before the end of the mandate? Are we agreed? Agreed. Great. Okay. Uh, there are no I items for matters arising. <coughs> uh, I'm now moving on to I can uh, bring up uh, ticket members out of the spotlight, and can we bring Rachel and Eileen up? Hi, Rachel. Hi. Hi. Yeah, apologies, I'm sounding a bit like a croaky frog at the moment, so I, I'm not my usual sort of uh, sort of clear and self. If you have any difficulties with hearing with me, just shout at me. It's a probably big okay. matter, okay? Um, the committee will now receive short oral briefings from Assembly Research on how Northern Ireland compares with other devolved administrations in respect of COVID allocation and expenditure, and regarding the difference between the draft 22-25 <coughs> budget resource allocation and all departmental pressures. Uh, we've got Rachel and Eileen with us. Uh, who's going to speak first? I'll start. Okay, over to you. Thank you, Chair, and good, good afternoon. Um, I will first of all speak to the paper on COVID funding in Scotland and Wales, and then Eileen will speak to the paper on departmental pressures. Yep. So, as you recall, I presented a briefing paper to this committee concerning COVID funding allocations and spending in Northern Ireland in February, and on the back of that paper was asked to look at COVID funding allocations and spending in other devolved administrations. Today, I'll give a brief overview of that paper and then can take any questions you may have at the end of my section. Table 1 in Section 1 of the paper looks at the overall quantum of COVID funding that was made available to each of the devolved administrations over the course of the pandemic. I think it's worth highlighting that up until the spending review in 2020-21, the total COVID funding made available to the devolved administrations was more than $26.5 billion. So the Scottish Government received approximately half of that, that is $9.6 uh, billion in 2020-21 and then $4 billion in 2021-22. The Welsh Government received just over $8 billion overall and that was $5.8 billion in 2020-21 followed by $2.4 billion in 2021-22. Then, as you know, the Northern Ireland Executive received just over $3 billion in 2020-21 followed by $1.5 billion in 2021-22. I discussed the previous, in the previous briefing paper how allocations of COVID funding from the UK government were allocated unevenly throughout the year, with some allocations occurring very near the end of the financial year. That paper also highlighted the fact that the Northern Ireland Executive chose to carry over £330 million into the 21-22 financial year. And it's worth noting that both the Scottish Government and the Welsh Government did the same with their late allocations. So the Scottish Government carried over £1.2 billion and the Welsh Government carried forward £660 million into 21-22. Moving on. To section two of the paper, which focuses on COVID allocations and spending by the Scottish Government. As you may recall, the strategic approach of the Northern Ireland Executive fell into two distinct phases. That was the COVID-19 response followed by the COVID-19 recovery. The response phase included actions which aimed to protect people, services and the economy in order to maintain stability, while the recovery phase included activities aimed to accelerate recovery. 
The approach in Scotland was not dissimilar to this. The Scottish response phase focused on four harms, which were direct harm to people's health, the wider impact on health and social care services, and the impact on no non-COVID health harms, harm to the broader way of living in society, and harm to the economy. The Scottish Government then published its strategic document on COVID recovery in October of 2021, which set out its vision for recovery. It's worth noting that the document had uh, the added focus on tackling inequality and disadvantage. And just for the sake of comparison, the Northern Ireland Executive published its recovery plan and strategic document in July of 2021, so a similar time frame. Mm -hmm. Turning now to, section, to subsection 2.2, the, the Scottish budget for 2020-21 was finalised in February of 2020 before the onset of the pandemic and so did not include any COVID funding allocations. In a normal year, the Scottish, the Scottish budget is revised twice throughout the year using supplementary budgets. In 2020-21, there were three revisions of the budget to account for the additional monies made available to support the COVID-19 response. So the summer budget revision in May of 2020 allocated just over 4 billion in funding toward the COVID-19 response and this 4 billion comprises just over 3.5 billion of COVID-19 Barnet consequentials as well as non-COVID Barnet consequentials and then reprioritise funds. During the autumn and spring budget revisions a further 2.5 billion and 3.2 billion of allocations were made. Again, these allocations comprise of Barnet consequentials and reprioritise funds. One thing I would say here, as you recall, the Northern Ireland Executive completed a reprioritisation exercise before the first monitoring round. I think at that time, approximately 140 million of funds were reprioritised towards the COVID response, but after that time, it becomes more difficult to track. The Scottish Government, however, clearly stated three instances throughout the year um, that 255 million, then 142 million, and then 475 million were reprioritised towards the response. Yeah. Did, so, Richard, when you were looking at it, so the Scottish Government seemed to have been um, very focused on spending the monies that they had and then identifying fairly early on if ever there was likely to be to move it over to the next stage of reprioritisation and the rest of it. In your research, did you get a, a sense that uh, both the Scottish and the Welsh actually were more effective in spending the money that they had, rather than sort of as we seem to do, we go through and sort of we went sort of kept on handing it back into the centre because it was it didn't seem to be properly allocated or was unable to be spent. I'm not sure if it was in terms of um, actual, uh, you know, expenditure. I think it's in terms of how the expenditure was tracked. Um, so uh, we know that in Northern Ireland, departments had some flexibility to use funding uh, in, in other means throughout the COVID pandemic. And some of that funding isn't tracked very well. Um, or we haven't asked the departments sort of to, to go back and look at that re retrospectively. Um, so I don't think it's in terms of, you know, if we looked at the, sort of the overall underspends at the end of the year, there wasn't a lot of overall underspends generally. Um, and I, I'm assuming that some of that money was used on the COVID response. It just wasn't tracked as being used, used it, it, for the COVID response. Um, the Scottish government and the Welsh government do a good job or did a good job at certain points of um, highlighting that, that that's where the money was coming from. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Richard. Um, so, turning to section uh, figure one in section two, subsection two point two, and that shows the main priority area for COVID funding allocations, and that was health funding and then support for businesses. And this was similar to what we experienced in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. uh, turning now to section 2.4.2, as you would expect, the Audit Office in Scotland produced a series of reports concerning COVID-19 funding in Scotland. One of those reports focused on tracking COVID funding, COVID spending, however, highlighted issues with the availability of transparent data on expenditure. Another publication focused on business support, and again, the issue of transparent data was highlighted here as well. Okay. If I turn your attention back to the situation in Northern Ireland, as you know, the Northern Ireland Audit Office estimated that a lar large proportion of the Northern Ireland COVID spend, approximately one billion in the first year, was in the form of grant payments. Also, the Northern Ireland Audit Office published two reports of interest, um, the, the one on the Support Sustainability Fund and one on the Small Business Support Scheme. Both of these reports highlighted issues with each scheme and the risk of grant fraud. 
This is something that was also picked up by Audit Scotland. In its report on the consolidated accounts for the year, it stated that the St Scottish Government Government accepted a higher than normal fraud risk, and this was due to both the speed at which business support schemes were set up and the need to make payments quickly. However, they noted that the Scottish Government estimated that no more than one or two percent of payments were uh, due to fraud or error. Yeah, and I don't think the Scottish <laughs> Government paid a million quid to uh, St Andrew's Golf Course either. Yeah, perhaps. Um, the issues related to fraud and error was picked up by the Public Accounts Committee recently, and they've asked for additional evidence on this. So I expect that um, whenever their report's complete, we'll have a sort of a clearer picture on that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Section three of the paper um, considers COVID funding allocations and spending in Wales. So similar to both the Northern Ireland Executive and the Scottish Government, the Welsh Government published a number of strategic documents concerning their COVID-19 response. Again, they appear to have had a similar approach, uh, focusing first on the COVID response and then on the COVID recovery. It's interesting, though, to note that their publication entitled COVID-19 Reconstruction Challenges and Priorities, um, which is their um, strategic document on their recovery, was published published in October of 2020, implying that the recovery phase began much earlier in Wales than in Scotland and Northern Ireland. Turning now to subsection 3.2, the Welsh budget for 2020-21 was finalised in February of 2020 and so did not include any COVID funding allocations and that was the case in Scotland and Northern Ireland as well. In a normal year, the Welsh budget is revised twice throughout the year using supplementary budgets. Similar to Scotland, in 2020-21 there were three revisions of the budget to account for the additional monies made available to support the COVID-19 response. In Wales, the COVID-19 response centred around four main pillars. That was health and public services, supporting the economy, the voluntary sector and communities, and then transport. Similar to the responses in Northern Ireland and in Scotland, the majority of COVID funding was allocated to health and also to business support. At the time of writing, the consolidated accounts for the year 2020-21 are not yet available and the Welsh Audit Office has not published any standalone reports on the Welsh COVID spend. There is, however, an open inquiry by the Public Accounts and Public Administration Committee, which considers the Welsh Government's COVID response. It is currently at the stage of receiving evidence, so a watching brief should be kept on the progress of this inquiry to understand more on overall spending and then any issues relating to fraud and error in grant funding in Wales. Okay. Well, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just coughing. Well, uh, one thing worth noting, in its legacy report, the Finance Committee in Wales alluded to how the approach to the allocation of COVID funding had had an impact on their budgeting processes more generally. That is, a more centralised approach to budgeting, with the Minister making individual specific allocations to particular schemes and projects and priorities, rather than a general uplift to the departments going forward. Yeah. And just, uh, just, okay. just, just, Richard, just as Andrew, I uh, mm -hmm. met informally with the chairs of the uh, Scottish and the Welsh finance committees, and we talked quite a lot about where we were with, um, particularly on the uh, looking on the analysis of the COVID spend and how sort of we took differing approaches to how it went through and how it reached as well. I think one of the there is a lot of I think uh, similarities. And one of the things, I don't know if I can do that, but what I might like is if it's possible for this research paper to go to the chairs of the two other committees, yep. if that would be possible. Yep. But I think that would be that would be very valuable because I think this would be a very valuable piece of research. And then they can look at what we've said about Scotland and Wales and they can come back and say if there's, if there's any nuances that we've missed. Or uh, probably I think they, they'll realise what an excellent piece of work this has been done. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you. Um, yeah, just to conclude, um, each of the jurisdictions treated COVID funding as a separate exercise, which ran alongside their normal budgeting practices. Both the Scottish Government and the Welsh Government completed additional supplementary budgets in 2020-21 to aid transparency, and these mostly focused on COVID spending. So that's COVID Barnet consequentials and then internal prioritisation rather than COVID funding specifically. However, there are issues with the data available in order to fully track some of the expenditure. Also, the Scottish Government noted that as Scotland moves into the recovery phase, it will likely become increasingly difficult to define what is and what is not COVID-19 spending, which might be something that if we were to look at this further, we may experience here as well. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Okay, I just asked one as I went through. Team, anybody want any questions? Okay, 
Uh, thank you very much indeed. And the next question is on, I think it's in Northern Ireland Water. No, it's, the, uh, it's the gap. It's from Eileen about the uh, budget gap. Oh, sorry, the budget gap. Who's, who's been, uh, Keith, Keith, I think it's a question. Sorry. Keith, sorry, have you got a question? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can, yeah. Mm -hmm. Rachel, whenever you were looking at that paper, uh, our cross Robertson between the other parts of the United Kingdom, what did you see that we done well or done bad based on what work you did, do, to be fair? Um, well, I had a lot more information on on what we did in Northern Ireland. I had information sort of from the finance department on bidding um, and stuff like that. So I think you know if we were to um, talk to the other uh, finance committees, it would be it would be an interesting point if they have more uh, um, information on the process for how funds were prioritised. Um, I think something looking at effectively, you know, our audit office has had a chance to publish a couple of reports on this, on COVID funding and COVID spending, and that's been really helpful. Um, Scotland and Wales are in the process of doing that, so I think we'll be able to um, have a better idea going forward once they've had a chance to put their reports together. And maybe this is a question for you, Steve. You, obviously, with your conversations with the other, you know, a, a, Chairs, do you see some sort of a follow up on that meeting again in let's say a few months' time if all works out? Obviously, Steve, to say, you know, this is what you did well, we done this badly, etc., etc., in layman's terms. Do you see that happening if things work out? Yeah, I think uh, from my discussions with the other two chairs, I think they, they are very keen to do that. And also, just uh, there's, there's a sense that maybe Whitehall was trying to uh, divide and rule. And giving different informations to different for the devolved administrations and us, and I think the opportunity for us all to get together <coughs> and actually discuss these issues, I think, was quite useful. And I think the other okay. point that I did say was there's a lot of um, lessons to be identified the way the other sort of administrations are doing it and how we're doing it as well. So one of the things that a future committee might consider doing, uh, and I'll leave it to them, is whether we should be considering having a joint meeting and particularly using that as an opportunity to talk to the likes of Treasury so they can actually come and address us all rather than uh, avoiding talking to one group at a time. Maybe a couple of us together could add more influence on that. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks for your information. Appreciate that. Thank you. Any others? Nobody else? Okay, okay, thanks. Okay, is Elaine speaking next? Yes. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this briefing paper was provided to you at page 18 of your committee pack, I believe. Yep. Um, so this briefing, as you recall, was commissioned um, following on from the raised briefing series that was done on the draft budget. <clears throat> And what it was trying to do was to look at the department minister's resource funding requirements to meet their pressures for 22 to 25 and look at that against the resource funding identified in the consultation document for the 22-25 budget, draft budget um, for the same period. Um, so we had to see um, what information we could rely on initially to do this. And again, it's, it would be, it was um, an endeavor to do a very basic comparison as far as possible. Um, so we looked to identify um, the department's um, completed bid templates for stage two, um, template one of the information gathering exercise that had been undertaken um, by DOF with the rest of the departmental ministers, um, which is highlighted in table one of um, the paper that you have on pages 20 to 21 of your committee pack. Um, and what that simply was, um, was a template that each departmental minister was to complete to identify resource budgets for 22 to 25 um, and it would be above the baseline that had been for 21 to 22. Um, just want to remind um, everyone that the 21 it, the the baseline for 21 22 is not the budget position it's the 21 22 um, budget position with the adjustments and other factors um, included, um, and some of those are time-bound allocations. Um, that's highlighted in the consultation document at page two, paragraph 5.4, four, 
And we would like to learn more about what the adjustments for certain factors, including time bound allocations are going forward. We would seek to engage with the officials um, further about that to gain more transparency about that. So we were looking to take those templates as they were completed and compare them against the figures in the um, draft budget consultation document alongside the Minister of Finance's written statement. However, and it comes with a big however, um, the comparisons we, that we, um, we, we couldn't, we, we basically couldn't um, produce conclusive findings. And it's due to a number of reasons, largely to do with constraints, constraints that concern the completed templates and that we didn't receive templates for all the departments. Um, but also, even the ones that we did receive, there were constraints arising out of how they were completed. But that's just looking at the templates to look across them. But then if you look at those, um, what is available, the information that is available, and look at it against the document, the consultation document itself and the written statement, um, there's uh, there's questions that arise out of um, the consultation document and the written statement in terms of untangling um, the ring fence funding, the general allocations, and the baseline funding. So, although there's been some progress in the um, consultation document and the written statement being more transparent potentially than in the past, there's still a ways to go that would enable us to undertake this kind of um, comparison exercise that is mapping the departmental template bid documents back to the consultation document. Um, so just to do a quick recap for you, um, we learned whilst trying to undertake this exercise when gathering the relevant documentation, bid documentation, um, TEO didn't complete templates um, during stage two template one, that would be for the resource um, above baseline. Um, health didn't reply to any of our requests, nor did economy. We did receive some holding replies from agriculture, environment, and rural affairs, but in the end, we didn't receive any papers. Um, the five departments that we did receive completed templates from were DOF, Department for Communities, Department for Education, and Department of Justice, along with Department for Infrastructure. Um, so as I said, we weren't able to do a comparative exercise against the bid templates against the consultation document. Um, but what we, which means we can't really conclude whether there, what the gap is and the extent to it. Um, but when looking at the template documents themselves and how they were completed, a number of issues arise, even for the five that we did receive the information. There's inconsistencies in how they're completed. For example, some department may include inescapable and high priority pressures while others don't. In addition, um, for example, ring fence depreciation may be included and others may not include it. In addition to the inconsistencies and in how they're completed, there also was a lack of clarity, um, which leaves ambiguities mm -hmm. um, arising out of what's contained in the information. And because of the lateness in which us, um, we received some of the information, we couldn't go back to them because sometimes you have to go back and forth to get clarity on things. Um, it was the, the 16th of March, we got some of this information. So um, maybe going forward, we'll be able to engage with officials and learn a little bit more in terms of, uh, again, chasing up and asking questions to clarify some of the ambiguities. But in addition to the inconsistencies and the um, lack of clarity, there was also variance in the amount of detail provided by one department to the other. Um, so all of that makes it difficult to arrive at any deductions. Um, and just would want to note that potentially, and again, we don't know because we don't have um, full, uh, we believe we have the guidance that was provided to the departments to complete the templates, mm -hmm. but I don't know if there was any additional information provided. The guidance, I understand that um, equipped the ministers to come and their officials to complete the templates were was the commissioning note 
dated the 19th of October, 2021. Um, but again, th there's just not a lot of detail in it um, to be fair to the departmental ministers who had to complete the templates. Um, so I'll come on in my parting comments to you as to maybe some lessons learned on that front. Um, moving away from the templates and on to the uh, consultation document and the um, written statement, um, we would suggest that maybe uh, it would be helpful recognizing there is greater detail in the consultation document maybe than what there was in the past, but we think that there is a lot more scope for providing um, greater explanation um, of identified resource funding um, in both the consultation document and the minister's statement to make the rationale underpinning the specific allocations more accessible. And that is the allocations for ring fence for specific purposes versus general allocations versus baseline funding. Um, and if there was more increased transparency on that front, um, it would enable the committees with greater ease to relate those documents back to the bidding document that was completed by the departments to enable comparisons. Um, potentially, um, a lesson learned from this, like I said, I come back to, is the future template design, maybe greater thought could be given to reducing the number of free text spaces and having um, more black and white responses provided in boxes um, because that would help to reduce the inconsistencies and also the variance in the detail as well as the lack of clarity um, and arguably more detailed guidance to accompany the template might help um, to um, improve the um, the information quality that allows that would allow for comparisons going forward and it would um, be suggested potentially that maybe it could be routine that the department's completed templates would be shared with the committees um, but that would only be really beneficial if the future template design contemplated some of the things we've mentioned here as well as the um, related um, guidance that would accompany it. Um, and we just remind the committee very humbly of, um, you know, the uh, OECD's, uh, I think it's February 2015, um, 10 best practice budgeting principles, um, which if some of these suggestions were taken on and driven forward, um, again, I acknowledge there has been improvement from past years, but there's still plenty of room to learn and forward to improve so that we have more openness and transparency relating to um, budget planning. Um, and as we all know, the committee has been trying um, since it's come back in January 2020 to in increase the openness and transparency in order to increase the accountability. Um, and just at a very basic point, if there were, if these things were tightened up more, it would save time for all, that there would be a lot of more efficiency and effectiveness that would enable the committees because the quality of the information would be there and um, the evidence base then is improved um, and you can conduct more considered analysis and more informed deliberations and hopefully lead to better decision making. Thank you. Eliane, thank you very much indeed for your very comprehensive paper. Um, <clears throat> one thing has struck me, and you've said about trying to get sort of data and consistent data from the various departments. Do you sense that the reason why they couldn't give us consistent data that is let out by OECD is because they didn't have it? And maybe this is indicative of a, a bigger prob prob problem we have at the moment with sort of uh, the whole sort of budgeting and finance process at the moment, because we're not asking difficult questions within the sort of the templates. Those figures should be readily to hand to each si sim single department. Who, if we can't get that information, how is the Department of Finance making its assessments on the overall budgetary process at all? Because Obviously, they're not getting access to the information either. Um, the, the, the department would have had access to these bidding templates. Um, it's it's the 
but the department is sitting and in further engagement and discussion with the departmental ministers that we would be in um, in Rays and because um, so it's I wouldn't necessarily I wouldn't have the information to say that the information isn't there to hand. It's just the format in which we got it in these bidding templates. It begs questions. So because it begs so many questions, you have to go back and mm -hmm. forth yeah. to make sure you have a full picture before you can come and make any draw any conclusions from it. So again, I'm back to the point about improving <clears throat> the design of the template and improving the guidance that accompanies it so that the templates are completed in a more consistent fashion so that then the committees can make these comparisons with more ease of reference. I mean, it, remind, and sorry, Alan, it reminds that, me of the conversation we had with the Fiscal Council and they sort of, they said the lack of transparency and understanding and consistent approach across the departments as well. So, I mean, the Fiscal Council are saying it, you're saying it, it just, just raises the question with me of what control do actually the Department of Finance actually have over the sort of um, the budgeting process within the departments themselves, because if the quality of information is not getting to you and the quality of information is not getting to the Fiscal Council, what sort of information are they dealing with? But, but you raise a really good point there, Chair, about what the Department of Finance has authority to do and doesn't do, because it's a power-sharing executive, so they're not there with any greater power than another department. So um, th these questions have been raised in the past um, over a decade. You know, um, the, 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 the Department of Finance will be relying on the completed templates as they come back you know, and the quality of the information that's on them. So if they have the cooperation of all the ministers that they're all through the executive agreement that they're going to complete the templates in accordance with the guidance, um, you could say maybe Department of Finance could um, enhance. Um, there's been market improvement in relation to the templates and the guidance, but maybe there could be even more. And the consultation document as well. It's about increasing the openness and transparency of the complex um, financial arrangements here. So those, um, the consultation document plays an important role in increasing understanding beyond the departments mm -hmm. and into the committee. Um, so again, it's more, there just there needs to be there can't be assumed knowledge in these areas, and they have to almost give um, a primer um, in the in the consultation document so that um, there's greater un knowledge and understanding of how the financial arrangements work under devolution in Northern Ireland. Okay, thanks very much. Can we uh, send a copy of that paper? Are we allowed to send a copy of that paper to the Fiscal Council? Sure, yes. Uh, yep. Yes, we're going to take that for action the rest of it. Team, any questions? Just say if there's any hands up. No. Okay, dokey doos. Okay. <clears throat> and finally, uh, sort of, Peter, were you going to talk on the raise paper on NI Water? Just what we got to. Thanks, Chair. The, the committee had asked about NI Water's budget pressures and the impact of its governance arrangements on its financial sustainability. The relevant paper is at page 25 of your meeting packs. Uh, the paper basically says that if high inflation continues, uh, NI Water will continue to face resource pressures. If budget allocations fall below the funding requirement identified in the utility regulator, regulator's final determination, this will exacerbate the problem. Um, so what had been happening was that Northern Ireland Water had, had to go back to the uh, department and to the executive looking for additional money, and this was all being driven by higher electricity costs. Northern Ireland Water is uh, Northern Ireland's biggest user of electricity, <laughs> so when the, the price of gas and electricity changes, it usually hits them pretty hard. Uh, Northern Ireland Water's uh, current governance arrangements and financial model do not provide it with the types of protections against price shocks available to other water and sewerage companies in GB, such as cash reserves and access to borrowing. So when Northern Ireland Water's costs exceed its resources, its only recourse is to ask the executive to make up the shortfall. So in other words, there are 
bigger sort of macroeconomic things going on here, which will probably affect, uh, which will undoubtedly affect um, other water and sewerage companies in the United Kingdom. Um, those other companies, because of the way that they are, um, because of their governance arrangements, are more able to deal with those situations because they have access to cash reserves and access to borrowing. Northern Ireland Water doesn't, and so it must uh, go back to the executive um, looking for finance. So we could expect them to, um, if the situation continues as it is, um, to uh, again, I guess, uh, be looking for more, more money from the executive in order to meet um, the cost pressures that it is facing. Okay. So, Chair. Okay. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, can we share that with the um, Department for Infrastructure? Um, oh, so sorry, a, sorry, uh, Infrastructure Committee. Committee. Oh, okay. No, there's no point. Um, for no. their legacy? No, there's no point, is there? No, it's not. No, okay. It'll be published anyway by RAIS, so why not? Okay. Infrastructure <laughs> Committee can see it. Right. Rachel, uh, Elaine. Um, this is the sort of the last time we'll be speaking. It's the last time this mandate. I just wanted to pass on my as chair of this committee, and indeed I hope I'll, I'll think I speak for the rest of the committee in saying and thank you very much indeed for the absolutely excellent work that you've done. And it's not often you can say that there's your research is making a real difference, but it does. And you've shown a light on a lot of areas that, uh, to say the least, in the past have been quite murky. And I think you should be all and everybody in Rio should be proud of everything you've done. It's been an absolute pleasure working with you. And at some stage in the future, I'm not quite sure when, I look forward to working with you again. But thanks very much indeed. Cheers. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. thanks. Okay, next item on the agenda, uh, item number seven, statutory rule victims of crime commissioner designate. Uh, the department has made statutory rule 22105, the superannuation victims of crime commissioners designate order Northern Ireland 2022. <coughs> Briefing notice on page 33 and the statutory rules page 34. Statutory rules subject to negative resolution procedure. The committee considered the proposed rule on the 9th of March and had no objections. The rule will come to the effect of the 1st of April. The examiner's statutory rules has reported on the rules has no comment to make. The rule is designed to make pension provision for the victims of crime commissioner designate until a formal appointment is made. The further statutory rule will be devised when the victims for crime commissioner is appointed by the Department of Justice in the next mandate. Are we? Con Ten, yes, therefore we are. The committee has considered Statute Rule 22105, the superannuation victims of crime commissioners designate order Northern Ireland 2022, and there is no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. agreed. Thank you. Our next item on the agenda Statute Rule Energy Performance of Buildings. The Department has made Statute Rule 202291, the Energy Performance of Buildings Certificates and Inspections Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2022. The clerk's note is at page 42 and the statutory rule is at page 43. They affirm, the Assembly affirmed the rule earlier this month. Are members content to note the statutory rule 2022-91, the Energy Performance of Buildings, Certificates and Inspections Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2022? Is this agreed? Agreed. agreed. Uh, next item on the agenda, statutory rule decapitalisation rate. The Department has made 2022-124 evaluation for rating decapitalisation rate regulations in Northern Ireland 2022. Uh, Peter's briefing notes at page 50 and the statutory rule is at page 51. The statutory rule is subject to negative resolution procedure. The committee considered the proposed rule on the 5th of January 2022 and has no objections. The rule will come into operation on the 14th of April 2022. All non-domestic properties are valued for rates by reference to an estimate of rental value, but some of these properties are rarely rental. It is necessary to value them with reference to construction costs. The decapitalisation rate, often referred to as the decap rate, is the conversion factor needed to derive an annual equivalent or rental value from the depreciated construction cost estimate. There are two rates, a standard decap rate for most specialised properties and a lower decap rate for education, healthcare and church properties. Under the rule, the decapitalisation rate shall be a 2.27% in the case of a church hereditament or educational hereditament or a healthcare hereditament, and b 3.5% in any other case. The rate will apply for Reval 2023. This is a reduction from the 2015 regulations, which were a 2.67% in the case of a church hereditament, an educational hereditament or a healthcare hereditament, and b 4% for any other case. Members, are we content? Content. Okay. The committee has considered Statute Rule 2022-124, the valuation for rating decapitalisation rate regulations Northern Ireland 2022, and subject to the report of the examiner, Statute Rules has no objection to the rule. Is this agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Agreed. 
Next one, statutory rules, social sector value. The Department has made 2022-125 the rate social sector value amendment regulations Northern Ireland 2022. Clark's notice at page 59, the statutory rule is at page 60. The statutory rule is subject to negative resolution procedure. The committee considered the proposed rule on the 9th of March 22 and has no objections. The rule would come into operation on the 11th of April 2022. The Department explains that the rate social sector value regulations Northern Ireland 2007 allows the Department the discretion to allow properties owned by the Northern Ireland Housing Executive or Housing Association, as listed in Schedule 1 of those regulations, to be charged rates on the basis of a social sector value relating to the rent payable rather than on the basis of the property's actual rateable capital value. The rule provides a revision to the relevant schedule to reflect a name change of one of the housing associations. South Ulster has now become Arbor Housing Association. The Department indicates there are no financial implications. This is purely a technical amendment. Members, are we content to note? Yes. The, member, the Committee has considered 2022-125 the Rate Social Sector Value Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2022 and subject to the report of the examiner, statute rule has no objections to this rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. Uh, next one, statutory rule public service pensions. The Department has made 2022-126 the Public Service Civil Servants and Others Pensions Amendment No. 2 Regulations Northern Ireland 2022. Briefing notes at page, uh, the briefing notes at page 67 and the statutory rule is page 68. The statutory rule is subject to negative resolution procedure and will come into effect on the 1st of April 2022. The committee considered the proposed rule on the 16th of March 2022 and had no objections. The secondary legislation will move all active members to the reform scheme Alpha from the 1st of April 2022 and enable the ending of future accrual and closure of the PCSP NI from 31st of March 2022. This ensures that from 1st of April 2022, all active members will be in the Alpha Career Average Revalued Earnings Defined Benefit Civil Service Pension Scheme and any future accrual of benefits will be in this scheme. The rule maintains the principle of parity in pension matters between Northern Ireland and the rest of our nation. If members are content, therefore, the Committee has considered 2022-126, the Public Service, Civil Servants and Others Pension Amendment No. 2 Regulations, Northern Ireland 2022, and subject to the report of the examiner, statutory rules has no objection to this rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. agreed. Uh, next item on the agenda uh, is the committee legacy report. Uh, the committee is asked to consider its legacy report. There's a page. Uh, the report is at page 86. Members, do we have any views apart from the fact that it's a very good piece of work? Okay. Therefore, we are content. Therefore, is the committee therefore content with the legacy report? Is the committee content to publish the report to the, on the committee web pages? Is this agreed? Agreed, and I think it's, it would be remiss if we didn't thank the clerk uh, and, and, and others in the staff for their. I'm sure we'll be thanking them at the end of today for their more work more broadly. But I think the legacy report, particularly given the burden of legislation and other things we've mm -hmm. asked them to do recently, is appreciated. Thank you. And very impressive, and um, shows the members of this committee possibly in a better light than, <laughs> than our actual input might sometimes, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes merit. Oh <Yeah. laughs> uh, dear, oh dear. Yeah. I'm going to miss you for the next year. <laughs> right, next item on the agenda is number 13, correspondence, correspondence index. Members asked to note the index of receipts item of correspondence on page 110. Uh, first item, RHI. The committee is asked to note at page 112 that departmental response to the committee query seeking confirmation as to whether the Minister of the Executive Office signed off on the adapted RHI disciplinary oh. process. The Department provided this response at the end of January 2022, but owing to an error in the Committee Office, this was not previously shared with members. Are we content to note? Noted. Yeah. NISRA. The Committee asked to note on page 116 in NISRA quarterly update on NICS sickness absence October to December 21. COVID absence is included in chest and respiratory illness, which is around 15% of the total absence. 80% of this kind of absence is owing to COVID. Overall absence levels continue the trend of returning to pre-pandemic levels. Are we content to note? Okay, no. Uh, next one's quite interesting. Um, COVID recording. The committee is asked to note on page 134 further clarification from the Department of the Treatment of COVID-related absence. Statistics on long COVID are not available. Yeah. 
Absence owing to COVID was at almost its highest level during October-December 21 since the pandemic started. However, the Department also advised that since November 2021, the first 10 calendar days of an absence attributed to COVID-19 must be recorded as paid special leave in HR Connect and not a sickness. Hmm. Okay. Are we content to note the correspondence? Okay, agreed. Yeah. Okay. Rating debt. The committee is asked to note on page 137 a breakdown of domestic and non domestic rating debt by council area. 53% of the total debt is domestic, though this varies considerably from Mid Ulster, which is about 66%, to Belfast, which is 40%. Overall, domestic rating debt has increased by 33% in a year. I think that's indicative of the pretty poor financial situation that many many people in Northern Ireland find themselves in the rising rate of inflation. Are we content to note this correspondence? Noted. No. Uh, House of Lords Committee on VAT. The Committee is asked to note on page 140 a copy of correspondence from the House of Lords Northern Ireland Protocol Committee to Treasury Minister Re EU VAT and Excise Duty Explanatory Memorandum. Is the Committee content to note the correspondence? There is. Agreed. Uh, composite information request. Members are asked to consider the composite information request at page 142. Is the committee content with the composite request as an accurate and complete record of the composite information? Agreed. Uh, further item coming in the Community Renewal Fund. The committee is asked to note at page 16 a table items a response from the Minister for Communities for the Executive Office commenting on the Community Renewal Fund and prospects for the Shared Prosperity Fund. The Department of Finance leads on the future policy and finance work streams and is engaging with uh, DULUHC on the uh, SPF. The Department predicts a net loss of £80 million owing to the withdrawal of EU funding streams. Are we content to note? I think we're agreed to that. No. Yep. Oh, was there another? Sorry. So, I, I sorry. Don't have that. sorry yeah. No, I think mine, I probably put the wrong thing in. Uh, finally, there is a... The Nero Z, Nero Zero, sorry, Nearly Zero Energy Building Guidance. The committee is asked to note on page 20, 20 uh, table items a response from the department advising that the Nero, Nearly Ener Zero Energy Buildings Guidance is to be issued shortly and take effect from June 2022. Are we content to note this correspondence? Noted. Okay. Oh, I'll just make sure that's it. Okay. Uh, any other business? Okay. Okay, team. Finally, I just want to say a few words. Um, sorry, Matthew sort of beat me to it. Away. Um, this has been a particularly interesting um, committee to be on. Um, hi, Gemma. Good to see you. Yeah, it's been a particularly interesting committee to be on, and I must admit, it's been thoroughly enjoyable. Um, it has been. It has had its moments. It's had interest. It's shown that the role of effective committee work within the Northern Ireland Assembly does have uh, direct input and results. And I want to thank all of you, every single one of you, for your very for your hard work that you put into the committee and keeping the committee running mm -hmm. and asking sort of both challenging questions and doing uh, what I think has been doing sterling work as members of the Legislative Assembly. And I think I want to thank you all as the chairman of this committee for all the hard work that you've done. And also to the previous members who are, who are no longer with us, uh, who have gone to uh, other committees or have in, uh, indeed left the Assembly, I think uh, I would like to say I, I wish them all the best as well in their future endeavours. And one of the final things I would like to say is obviously uh, we're heading into a particularly uncertain term. Uh, who knows who's coming back? Who knows if we even are going to come back or whatever we're going to do? But whatever it is, I hope that in the fullness of time there will be a finance committee again. And indeed, whatever future finance committee there is has the opportunity to work as diligently as we have and actually to try somehow to hold truth to power, which I think is something is, uh, I think has been particularly useful of what we've done. And the final thing, I would like to really thank the clerks and the team who have been working assiduously behind here. It has, on many occasions, been a thankless task. And for I lost count of the number of budgets, finance bills, raised papers, papers raised, and the rest of it that we have had to deal with over the last couple of years. And I think it's been a tribute to the team here of all the hard work that they've done. And I would just like you to join me in saying thank you very much indeed, Peter. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, everyone else who's out there. Thank you very much indeed for your hard work.
and it's been an absolute pleasure working with you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> okay. Right. Oh. Uh, oh, sure. sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just on uh, behalf of our own party as well, to Sinn Féin and our members from the committee, and that uh, again, I'd like to thank you as chairman for conducting what at times were uh, uh, thrown waters, could you describe it as? <laughs> at least we sailed through it one way or the other. The ship didn't sink, <laughs> not just stay, <laughs> stayed on top. Uh, and uh, just to endorse the comments that you made too in relation to uh, the backup, uh, I.e. the secretarial backup in every respect to the committee and that, I were very, very appreciative. But as I said in another committee previously uh, this week, uh, it's uh, been very informative, a great insight, and uh, uh, if anything reflects just the complexity, not just of finance itself as a committee, but probably the whole affairs within uh, the Assembly and that as well too. So, Gurmil Ma Agaf, Party, Sinn Féin. So, thank you ever so much, everyone, uh, on behalf of Sinn Féin. Thank you. Matthew? Uh, well, I'll just very briefly, Chair, um, I, I add my own and my party's um, uh, good wishes to the well, colleagues on the committee, um, particularly, I think, to the um, to the clerk, Stephen, and the other support staff who've been um, have done a huge amount of work, particularly legislative, towards the end of the mandate. I suppose it would also be worth thanking um, uh, Peter's predecessor, Jim McManus, who obviously um, uh, we we came into this uh, mandate kind of halfway through. Some of us were um, uh, co-opted uh, and and were very novice in terms of uh, the committee, and the committee had some very high-profile work to do. So, um, uh, yeah, hopefully. Um, uh, are not. We will return here in some form to actually govern this place. Uh, it, although it does feel slightly surreal to be adjourning today without um, either Jim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> Enjoying himself in the Isle of Man. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Keith. Yeah, uh, just I suppose on behalf of myself, Chair. I want to thank you for the way you obviously conduct the meetings and Peter. To be fair, keeping me right whenever I'd step in at a short time, and Stephen as well. And just to say, Chair, you have a bit of a nasty cough, and I reckon you'd sit in the house the next sort of five to six weeks and not go out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no chance in that. Be far doing that and just keeping, keeping your head down. Get yourself <laughs> in a good fight before. <laughs> okay. Well, the one thing I can say, Committee, that of all the things that you know we've done and the hard work, the one thing we we'll probably will be remembered for is, of course, the pigeon. <laughs> Yeah, that would be it. Right, I've got a final piece of admin over to you, Peter. Oh, just uh, also just to thanks members for their attendance and diligence throughout um, this uh, shortened mandate, but also just to remind members to hand in their service pros, including their stylus, if you've still got it, on the charger to IS. <laughs> um, the pen. <laughs> I, it's, it's this. Like I, I've still got mine, but by a miracle. <laughs> so um, if you've still got it, to return those to IS office. But thanks very much, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Okay, everybody. That's it. Okay. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, program signed.